This is 8K resolution, and this is my review of the Canon R5. Reviewing the Canon R5 properly is an interesting dilemma. On one hand, you have photographers who love it, but on the other, you have hybrid video shooters who maybe criticize it, maybe to an extreme, for the overheating issues that do affect this camera. I'm gonna try and take somewhere in the middle of that road. I am a hybrid shooter, but I do enjoy shooting with this camera. However, it's not the perfect tool for every job. So I'm gonna try and balance all of those factors the best I can and give you my honest impressions of using this camera. This is a rental unit that I paid my own money for. Canon didn't send it to me. It's not a freebie loaner. I went out of pocket because I've criticized it in the past for its overheating issues, but I really wanted to know how it actually felt to use the camera day to day and week to week, taking both photos and video. That being said, we need to talk about the firmware because that's probably one of the most important things about the R5 is the firmware because there have been some updates. I was testing all of this with 1.1.0. There is a new 1.1.1 firmware. It seems like Canon is rolling these out relatively quick, so more changes may come in the future. But just so you know, this entire review, everything I'm talking about, the camera body that I rented had version 1.1 on it. So that comes with some of the fixes and updates post initial release that may have been more discussed in a lot of other reviews. First, let's talk about the specs on the Canon R5. This is a little redundant. You probably all know this stuff, so I'm just gonna go through it really quick. But of course, it shoots 45 megapixel raw stills at 20 frames per second. Pretty incredible, pretty powerful for photography, and very, very nice. It also shoots 8K raw, also shoots 10-bit and 8-bit 8K, which I think, can, I think can get lost in some of the people talking about the specs of this camera. 8K RAW is one of the main premier selling points, but it does 8K 10-bit and 8K 8-bit as well. So you don't have to shoot RAW 8K if you don't want to. You can do some compressed uh, versions of 8K as well. Of course, it does 4K 120, 10-bit and 8-bit from basically the full sensor readout, which is really impressive. It's got great autofocus and it's got great IBIS, or so they say. But we're gonna talk about all this in more detail. Here's some considerations just right up front, and you can see these photos were taken with the R5. This is just my personal perspective. I really can't stress that enough. This is by no means definitive or saying that you have to agree with me. This is just my personal perspective. I cannot speak for the thousands or millions of shooters out there who are gonna use the R5. I can't predict every scenario. I can only talk from what I personally encountered and how the camera applies to me. Um, so I'm just keep that in mind. Everyone is different and you're gonna have different needs. You're gonna have different priorities. That's totally fine. Again, this is just my personal perspective because I know my needs, but I have no idea what yours are. So again, just keep all that in mind. I'm really gonna try and approach this from a practical standpoint of workflow acquisition, processing, some of the quirks, just so you can really understand beyond just the specs. We all know the specs. We know what it is on the spreadsheet, on paper, but how does the camera actually function? What is it like to use it? First, let's start with photography because it is a really impressive camera for photography. Again, 45 megapixel stills at 20 uh, frames per second. That's really, really incredible especially with the electronic shutter, and you can basically just burst mode uh, silently all you want. It's incredible if you really need speed and high resolution out of a camera. The photo ergonomics, holding, handling the R5 works really well for photography. I'm, I come from a 5D Mark III, a 5D Mark IV, so you feel right at home using the Canon body. There are some differences in terms of buttons and layout, but it's stuff you get used to pretty quick, and it feels really good to shoot photos with the R5. You also have the incredible RF lens selection. Canon makes some of the best lenses out there, just some really interesting lenses. They're also very expensive in certain cases, but they do work really well, and then, they have the legacy EF glass from all their DSLRs that can be adapted very easily to RF. So you can go EF to RF pretty much seamlessly if you want. The adapter works really, really well, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. You do have great autofocus. Important for video, but also really important for photography in terms of face tracking, eye tracking, animal detection, people detection. 
it just works really, really well. I can basically pick up the R5, point it at my subject, and start taking pictures, and I don't have to worry about focus points or checking my focus. It just works. Considering the amount of hate that this camera has received for overheating, it felt appropriate to film with it in the middle of the Arizona desert. Now, it's not blistering hot out today, but as we know, this camera doesn't really suffer from overheating issues that are related to the external ambient temperature. It's more about the internal components. Now, Canon has released some firmware updates that have mitigated some of the issues. It's taking into account more of that external temperature than it was before upon initial release. But you will find yourself from time to time in a situation where the Canon R5 does overheat. Is it that big of a problem? For me personally, I find myself somewhere in the middle. It's not a huge deal breaker of an issue where it's gonna affect each and every shoot. However, I don't like the idea of in the back of my mind, me always worrying about the camera and the state of the internal temperature. So I've done a few things with the way I shoot using the R5 to mitigate some of those risks, but it still is there and it is really gonna depend on how you shoot, what you shoot, and what your workflow is like. I can't make the recommendation that this camera is good for everybody because there are certain situations where you'll find yourself in a situation where the camera overheats and no one wants to be there. I think the overheating issue is one that can be sidestepped by and large. There's a lot of people where it's not gonna be a problem at all because they shoot in little clips or they turn the camera off in between takes, no big deal. But there definitely are those other people that shoot continuously for long periods of time. And if that's you and you want the high frame rates constantly or you want 8K constantly, you're gonna be very limited by this camera. And I imagine that those issues will pop up more often than not if that's the type of shooter you are. This applies to the 4K HQ mode and the 4K 120 mode. I think people also know that it applies to the 8K mode, but more commonly, I think people are gonna be using this camera for 4K HQ and 4K 120. And these modes are restricted by this thermal locking. It happens even in standby mode. So this isn't something where only when you're recording it affects you, it happens when you're just in standby. This picture that you see here was taken after the camera was just sitting there and I, it was just on, I picked it up and I couldn't shoot anything because it had overheated or been thermal locked just because it was sitting there. And I did have overheat control on, which is one of the new features in the newer firmware. So I'm basically doing the best I can to not have it overheat and standby, and it's still overheated. And there are some workarounds. So solving the problem is really important. When you have any problem, you have to figure out a solution, but it doesn't erase the problem. I think this is where a lot of people will say, you know, oh, you just have to do X, Y, and Z, and then it's not a problem anymore. To me, that's a workaround, and that's fine. It's a good solution, but you still have to acknowledge the problem, which is totally fair. A workaround, the difficulty of the workaround, the ease of the workaround, that all equates, in my mind, to the severity of the problem. If it's an easy workaround, simple fix, not a big problem. If it's a complicated, dangerous workaround, well, then it's a really, really big problem. Almost every camera has issues that there are workarounds for. So ranking the severity of those problems is always based on the workaround, not necessarily on the problem itself. One of those that I did with the R5 during my time with it was just using the power saving, basically turning the display off after 15 seconds automatically, auto power off after 30 seconds, viewfinder off after a minute. These are all settings you can set easily in the menus to basically have the camera power itself down as frequently as possible. So you don't have to remember to turn it on and turn it off, turn it on and turn it off. The camera can just do it for you very, very quickly and almost irritatingly quick at certain points where it would just go to sleep and then I'd be ready to shoot again and have to kind of wake it back up. It's irritating, it's inconvenient, but I did find it as kind of a nice way to keep the camera cool more or less while I was in between recording sessions. But this isn't gonna fix the long continuous recording. It's purely for those little bursts where you're doing a couple clips, then you're moving somewhere else, doing a couple clips, moving somewhere else. It just ensures that the camera is actually off all the time in between, because again, it does overheat and standby. You can also do a date change and a battery pull to fix the 
thermal locking, which does work, and I encountered this myself. The R5 reached its thermal limit shooting 8K. I had roughly 15 minutes, and that timer went down and down and down to the point it hit zero, in which case I can't film anything else. But I'm able to film right away just by going into the menu, changing the date to one day in the future, and pulling the battery out real quick, it kind of resets that timer and now I'm back up to the full 15 minutes. So when people talk about this camera overheating and the temperature and the sensor and all this stuff, it really does feel like an arbitrary timer. Is it doing damage to the camera? I don't know. I don't know that anyone really knows, but it feels arbitrary. There's not an actual thermometer in the camera reading the temperature of the sensor or the processor saying it's too hot, you can't record. That's not what happens. It counts down that timer, it reaches a limit, and it says you can't shoot anymore, and all you have to do is change the date, pull the battery, and you're back up and running. So it's kind of a little bit of a hack, but you're not damaging the files, you're essentially not, clearly you're not damaging the camera really in the moment. Maybe long term there's some ramifications, but otherwise, if you're in a situation where that timer ticks down, it's really easy to reset it. I just did it. Let's talk about the video quality because I think this is obviously one of the shining points of the R5. You obviously have RAW uh, capabilities with 8K, but you also have 10-bit and you have 8-bit. You also have all I or IPB. And I really like the way the R5 lays all this stuff out in the menu where it kind of separates these things into their own little node. A lot of cameras will just combine the whole codec into one little tile and then you've got, you know, 50 or 100 different tiles to choose from. The R5 separates it all, and so you can kind of pick and choose which style you want. You've obviously got 8K, 4K, or even 1080, and you have this kind of option to go from 4K to 4K HQ, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. But it is interesting to distinguish between all the different options that you're presented with in terms of video quality. Of course, you've got 4K 120, which also looks pretty good. We'll talk about that more in a second. Let's talk about 8-bit versus 10-bit. So 10-bit on the R5 is activated when you go into the C-Log profile, the, that, that color, the look, the flat log profile. That's how you're gonna get 10-bit. So it is really slow to edit and render. I'm working on a somewhat recent MacBook Pro. It's not brand new, but it's not ancient either. And even on Mac, like I can't even preview these files in Finder. So it just causes stress on my operating system, on my processor. It's not the easiest and most intuitive thing to edit on your generic you know, computers that are out there. I'm sure there are newer machines that it works better. I've heard people even having success editing some of this footage on iPads. The newer your machine, the better. But if you have something that's a couple years old, just be aware that 10-bit, may cause it to chug. I run into the same problem even with the GH5 and those 10-bit files. My computer just does not like them, so it's something I only use when I am shooting log because that's when you need the extra bits of information when you're doing heavy color grading. If you're using a baked-in picture profile, neutral, portrait, landscape, one of the kind of default picture profiles, the camera is gonna go into 8-bit mode. So you can't actually choose between 10-bit and 8-bit. It's basically on the picture profile, which is kind of an automated way to make sure people shoot the right thing. If you're shooting with a picture profile, you probably don't need 10-bit. If you do, you could argue over that, really. But really, 10-bit is meant for log profiles, and 8-bit is perfectly fine for uh, regular picture profiles. And this is smooth playback. Even at 8K and for 4K 120, when I'm shooting 8-bit with the R5, plays back totally fine. So it's not as much of a resolution issue in terms of playback that you might think. It's really just the 10-bit versus 8-bit that causes my machine to chug. Let's talk about 4K HQ versus 4K, and I'm gonna call it LQ for low quality. If 4K HQ is high quality, well, let's talk about regular 4K as kind of low quality. 4K HQ is just 4K. This is something that's really, really important, and I think it's kind of smart how Canon did it with the R5 of calling it an HQ mode. Really, this is what just 4K should look like. It's the most detail that can be resolved in a 4K image, and that's what 4K should look like. So anything less than that, I'm gonna call 
4K, the, the regular mode, is actually 4K low quality. How many people would enjoy shooting in a mode called 4K low quality? Well, probably not many, but we all wanna shoot in this HQ mode because ooh, high quality, that sounds good. So Canon has strategically, I assume, called the actual, like just good 4K, what true 4K should look like, they've called that HQ, and then their regular 4K mode, they just call 4K, but really it's, it's lower quality. Uh, HQ isn't bigger file sizes. This is really, really important. People think, oh, HQ, it's gonna be bigger files, there's more data, yada, yada. No, no, it's still 3840 by 2160. The pixels are the pixels, it's still 4K, it's just processing better, which is really important to understand. When you're talking about resolution, the container is the, the resolution, 4K, whatever but the detail, what's actually resolved in that container is the true resolution of that clip. Obviously the HQ mode is restricted. You're gonna get that thermal locking or overheating, whatever you wanna call it. Whereas the lower quality mode, the regular 4K is unrestricted. You can record continuously and you're not gonna run into any overheating problems. Here you can see them side by side. On the left, we've got 4K, middle 4K HQ, and on the right, we have 8K scaled down to 4K. So on the right, that should be the absolute maximum best that 4K can look. And 4K HQ looks really, really close, almost indistinguishable from the 8K scaled down. So 4K HQ is looking really good, but 4K on the left, a little bit softer, and it can be fixed with some sharpening. But this is something we need to talk about in general with Canon video. It's always been kind of soft. 1920 by 1080 is, you know, 2 million pixels, give or take. 3840 by 2160 or 4K is 8.2 million pixels. One pixel is just one color. You can't put more pixels inside of one pixel. It's the pixel is the pixel. It's it's one thing. It's either black, it's white, it's gray, it's red, it's blue. But just because you have more resolution going in, if you're scaling it down to 4K or 1080 or whatever it is, the pixel is the pixel and it's only one point of data. So there is a maximum detail limit for 4K, you know, 3840 by 2160, there's 8.2 million pixels that can be something, which can be detail, or it could be absolutely nothing, but you can't get past that limit. You can't have 9 million pixels worth of resolution. You can't have 10 million pixels in 4K. It's, there is that upper limit, but there's no detail minimum. You could have one pixel and save it as a 4K file. You could have a, a smudge or a blurry standard definition video and blow it up to 4K and say it's 4K, but it's still gonna be standard def. It's still gonna be low detail. So when we look at 4K on the left and 4K HQ and 8K on the right, you can see hopefully a little bit of that shining through. Is it something your average viewer is gonna notice? Probably not. And it can be fixed with some sharpening. If we look at the sharpening there, which people say to sharpen the 4K footage and it'll look like the HQ footage, which I think it's fair to then also sharpen the 4K HQ footage and also sharpen the 8K footage to see what that would look like as well. And at this point, they do become very, very hard to distinguish between them for your casual viewer. If you wanna zoom into 100%, zoom into 200%, zoom into 800% and pixel peep, you will notice the details. But for the most part, a lot of people will be completely fine with the regular 4K and then some sharpening in post. However, the 4K HQ does look better and resolves more true detail than the standard 4K mode on the R5. Here's another example of some detail. You can see there with the 4K mode on the left, it's a little softer not quite as pristine and perfect as 4K HQ or 8K scaled down to 4K. Here we have 4K HQ on the left and 4K 120 on the right to compare, okay, are you taking a resolution hit when you switch to that 120 mode? And to my eye, it looks similar to just the standard 4K mode. You're losing some of that HQ detail, the extra detail that's resolved in that, you know, kind of oversampled mode, but in general, it's perfectly fine and acceptable to do the 4K 120 and then sharpen in post. Most people aren't gonna notice the difference if you're finalizing in 4K. It's really only those pixel peepers or the absolute image purists who are maybe even gonna spot the difference. But by the time it gets uploaded and compressed to the web, all that's probably gone anyway. I also wanted to compare it to 1080p 120 from the GH5. So up top, you can see 4K HQ. In the middle, you can see 4K 120 and then at the bottom, 1080, 120. 
108120 does look worse, but is it significantly worse? To your average viewer, probably not. So if you're considering the R5 because you think you need 4K 120, it's nice, it's great to have, but it is a restricted mode. It's gonna have that thermal lockdown on you. And if you have something that shoots 1080p 120 like the GH5, don't expect you're gonna have this radical upgrade for 4K 120. It is better, but by how much? Because this is 1080p scaled up to 4K. And at that resolution, some people may spot the difference, but many won't. If you do wanna use the R5 as a sort of vlog camera, you can see how the autofocus keeps up and what the microphone sounds like. This microphone is the one I'm wearing. This microphone is the one I'm talking to. Granted, I'm not as close to the camera as I could be. I could get even closer and we'll see how the autofocus keeps up. Gives you a pretty good sense of how it works, what it sees, what it doesn't see. And sometimes I find with the R5 that the autofocus, while it works well, Sometimes it can miss in an annoying way, so I wouldn't rely on it 100% of the time. Definitely, if you're in a situation where you need autofocus, do two or three takes just to make sure. A lot of times the eye tracking and the face tracking will look good on the screen, but then when you review the footage, it'll like miss you know, for a second and then snap right back in. Certainly one of the better autofocus systems out there, but it's not quite foolproof 100%. You can always rely on it. So if you are gonna use it, do a couple takes just to make sure you got the shot. Its ability to keep things in focus as you're moving, as the subject is moving, is just really refreshing to have that in a hybrid video camera. It works remarkably well. But it's something you have to consider. Do you want it? Do you need it? I think there's a lot of people who will want it and then find out they actually do need it for certain shots that they're not doing currently via manual focus. There's a lot of things you wouldn't even try because you know they're very, very challenging with manual focus that you may be more inclined to try with autofocus. A lot of people equate autofocus with vloggers or YouTubers trying to keep themselves in focus, which is true and very helpful, but it also applies to people shooting on gimbals or other configurations where the camera isn't easily accessible for using a follow focus or pulling focus manually. So just having good, reliable autofocus in those situations is really nice, and it can open up new styles of shooting for you. I think in a lot of ways, not necessarily the R5 specifically, but just the, the quality of autofocus in general is a game changer. It's going to give you so many more options when it comes to the type of shot you can get that you may have not been able to do by yourself before, but now you can as a, a solo shooter, as well as just the type of shots you're willing to try and experiment and play around with. I think it unlocks a lot of creativity and that we didn't really have before when we were mostly relying on manual focus. Manual focus isn't going away, it's not going anywhere, it's still fine if that's how you prefer to shoot, but autofocus does unlock quite a few benefits from my perspective. But it can also be a false sense of security, so I wouldn't rely on it 100% of the time. You really have to make sure that what you're shooting is in focus. A lot of the eye detection or face detection will be lighting up on the R5 display, and then upon review in post-production, you might see that it actually popped out of focus for you know half a second, then pop back in. So the LCD might say, yeah, it's totally in focus the whole time, and then you review the clip later and you realize, oh, it actually wasn't. The tracking works really well, but that doesn't mean it's always gonna stay locked exactly where you want it, so you really don't wanna trust it 100% and get into that kind of false security thinking it's it's perfect, it's okay. You really, really have to make sure it is in focus if it is something important. I'm using autofocus right now for all of these segments, but this isn't even an ideal situation. This isn't RF glass, it's EF glass being adapted to RF with the Canon adapter that has an ND filter built in. I'm doing that because I'm outside and I wanna be able to shoot in the sun with shallow depth of field without having to jack my shutter speed up through the roof. So. If you're in a situation like that, you're gonna need an ND filter, whether it's in front of the lens or behind the lens. I'm opting for this situation because it adapts all of my EF glass to RF glass. And while it might not be ideal for autofocus, it does seem to work pretty well. You can tell me what you think. I'm just using the face tracking autofocus and doing something that's very common for a lot of people in today's environment where they're creating content for YouTube. So if you have EF glass and you're adapting it to RF, this is what you can kind of expect in terms of that performance. I like it because I get to use that built-in ND filter and I can still use my EF glass without having to spend 
all this money on new RF lenses and then missing out on having an adapter with an ND filter. It is one of the benefits of switching from DSLR mirror box style cameras to a mirrorless mount. All that old glass, if it still works and can be adapted properly, you get those benefits of being able to put stuff in that adapter, whether it's a speed booster, an ND filter, or something else that you prefer. For me, I like the benefit of having an adapter with an ND filter right in it, so I can take it anywhere and still maintain all the benefits of autofocus in the Canon system. I'm converting a lot of my EF lenses to the RF mount, and I'm doing that because I get the benefit of a built-in ND filter in the EF to RF mount. Canon has a version of the EF to RF that has ND in it, which is fantastic. Still get smooth autofocus, so even using EF lenses, I'm still getting the face tracking, the eye detection, the quick autofocus, which is incredible that Canon has been able to do this if converting their EF glass to RF. You'd almost think it should come with more of a hit uh, in terms of performance, but it doesn't. It works remarkably well. It's very, very convenient to have a built-in ND filter. This is what I talk about all the time, especially if you're shooting outdoors. You have aperture, ISO, and shutter speed to control your exposure, but for video, your shutter speed should be relatively locked based on your frame rate and your ISO is only gonna go down so low and you probably want a shallow depth of field so you're gonna be filming with a relatively wide aperture, maybe 2.8, f4, f5.6. So really when you're outdoors, the only way to control the excessive amount of light is with ND filters. If they're in front of the lens that you have to deal with different size filters, different lenses, changing them all the time, when it's built right in the adapter, it's just really convenient and works really well. However, there is this maximum color shift. On the right, you can see at maximum, the image turns blue, aggressively so, where my white balance is set for daytime. You can even see in the, in the top picture there where I'm at the high setting on the ND filter in the adapter. It looks great, it looks fine, but the moment you go to maximum ND on that Canon, adapter, it just shifts the whole picture blue, which I find really annoying that they didn't stop. It's It does have hard stops on both ends on the minimum and the max. I wish they had stopped the max a little bit earlier to avoid that color contamination because it re is really irritating to push your ND to max and then always have to throttle it back a little bit to avoid that color shift. I'll say that the IBIS on the R5 is relatively mediocre from my experience. This could be a combination of you know adapters or the type of lenses, and maybe a certain lens isn't supported with the firmware, but I really find that other systems are better. Specifically, the Lumix system just seems to keep things more stable, like the way I would want, rather than what I'm experiencing on the R5. And it doesn't seem as optimized for video as it might be for still photography. At the bottom here, you can see kind of some data points that are taken from just basically just me holding uh, the R5 as well as the GH5 just pointed at a still dot on the wall. And then I tracked that data with After Effects to kind of map the plot of the movement of the shot. And you can see the Canon IBIS just regular is a lot more wild, it's, it's erratic. Now granted, this is zoomed in quite a bit, so this isn't like crazy shake from the IBIS, but it does show you at kind of a microscopic level the effect to which the IBIS is helping uh, which or, or which it's not. You can see the Canon enhanced, the pink dots there match more closely with the GH5 IBIS and the GH5 IS lock. Both of those modes are kind of meant to just stabilize your footage in general. The locking mode specifically is supposed to basically make it look like a tripod. So you can see how tightly uh, spaced those dots are and just how small that pattern is in the blue and the teal compared to the pink from the Canon Enhanced and the Canon IBIS, just the regular mode. And on the right, you can see when you use IBIS on the R5, it is gonna give you a crop. So if you just turn it on, you're already cropping your field of view. And if you go with Enhanced, it's even more severe. So that's something to keep in mind if you're buying the R5 because it's a full frame camera, the moment you rely on the more advanced IBIS and stabilization, the more you're cropping in on that footage and losing those benefits of full frame. We should also talk about white balance in regards to all this. It's record locked, and this is really, really irritating. The moment you hit record on the R5, you cannot change your white balance. You can even 
assign it to the RF control ring. If you have an RF lens like the 24 to 70, it has an extra control ring on that lens that you can assign to set white balance, which works great when you're not recording. You can spin that wheel, change your white balance on the fly, but the moment you hit record, you cannot change your white balance anymore. This makes sense for photography when you take a picture and your white balance is your white balance, you change your white balance, take another photo. But when you're recording and things are changing on the fly, you're moving from room to room, from space to space, not being able to change your white balance is really, really irritating because it means you have to stop recording, change your white balance, and then hit record again, making an entirely separate clip, which is fine if that's your workflow, but if you want long clips for continuous recording, you can't change your white balance on the fly. And I find that really irritating, especially because many other cameras allow you to change white balance on the fly, and R5 just doesn't let you do it. Find it really irritating. I do like the footage that comes out of the R5, but a lot of times when I'm recording, I lose access to some of the features or some of the display options that I want. And you can see on the top photo, that's before recording, but the bottom photo is during recording. And you can see how much information just disappears the moment you hit record. A lot of this information I find really valuable even during recording. So the time remaining, isn't displayed. You have the maximum time you can record up there in the top, it says 25 minutes. So I can record for 25 minutes and then once I start recording, I'm recording for nine seconds, but it doesn't tell me how much space I have left on the card. Can I keep recording for 30 minutes? Do I need to change cards in an hour? How much more time can I keep recording? It's kind of irritating not to know at a glance of when you're gonna to need to change cards. Also, the histogram disappears the moment you record. And this is not a situation where you can hit the info button or hit the display button to change your settings and, and get all this stuff back. The moment you hit record, all this stuff is gone. And the only way to get it back is to stop recording. So your histogram just disappears during recording. This may be fine for some people, but for me, I like seeing that my exposure is the exposure because the sun may come into play. It may change things a little bit. And if you have zebras on, that's a good way to control for it. But having a live histogram during recording seems really valuable to me. It also doesn't show you the codec. The moment you hit record and you go, oh, was I in 8K or was I in 4K? Like what, what mode am I in? It doesn't display, it's gone. So there's no good way to know other than stopping recording to check what codec you're in. Also really irritating it because you might be in the right one and you just wanna double check and know for sure that you're capturing 8K when you intend to be shooting 8K. Nope, you have to stop recording to check. It also doesn't tell you uh, the AF type. So if I'm in you know face detection mode, it doesn't tell me when I'm recording anywhere. It basically clears out the whole display for the sake of keeping a, a cleaner feed but I don't have the option to turn on all that other valuable information that was there before that's now missing. The exposure meter, you see at the bottom before, you can see if you're you know, over or under with stops, that disappears during recording. You can't bring it back. You also don't know what picture profile you're in. So if you're shooting C-Log, you do have a monitoring option to display kind of with a, a LUT so you can see that flat profile a little bit clearer on the display. But the moment you hit record, you don't know what picture profile you're in. So you have to dig through the menus, you have to stop recording, go see, okay, am I in neutral? Am I in C-log? Like, what am I shooting? Am I, am I in the right mode? Am I shooting 8-bit? Am I shooting 10-bit? It's important information that is just gone the moment you hit record. The quick menu also just turns to nothing the moment you're recording. You basically have headphone volume, and that is it. When you're recording, it's all gone. Just headphone volume. Compare that to the Lumix cameras, which show you the picture profile. They show you the codec. They show you the autofocus mode. They show you the time remaining. They show you audio meters. Now, the R5 does show you audio meters if you're in manual mode, but it doesn't show you audio meters when you're in, in auto mode. So just because I'm in auto, I don't wanna see the meters. Why, why wouldn't I want that? The R5 will show them in manual mode, but not if you're in auto mode. Shows you a histogram on the Lumix cameras. It shows you which card you're recording to during recording. It shows your exposure meter. It shows you that you're shooting log with a LUT if you have that activated. And the great thing about these cameras is if this is too cluttered, if this is too much junk on screen, you just hit the display button and you get that clean feed. You can cycle through the different views. So you can see the mode where it shows you everything and then you can hit display and then it's all gone and you have that clean feed so you can compose your shot and check your exposure just by eye. 
So you really have control over what you're seeing during recording. Whereas on the R5, I always felt limited. I felt like I had to stop recording just to check to make sure my settings were, were accurate and then start recording again. Really, really inconvenient. Compare the two menus. On the left, you have the Lumix GH5. On the right, you have the Canon R5. And you can see just how much more is there on the GH5 during recording compared to the R5, which basically strips all that information away. You have access to none of it. And I think that can be a re just really, really inconvenient as you're filming. We should also talk about buying these cameras used or new. Right now, they are very hard to find. If you want to buy the R5, good luck. They're, they're not getting shipments. Everywhere sold out. The people who have them are enjoying them. Everyone else is sitting there waiting in limbo. You also see inflated prices, upwards of $5,000, $6,000 in some cases for these cameras on eBay. It's insane considering the you know retail value of them is four thousand dollars. So the prices right now, because they are you know in short supply, are really really high, way higher than they ought to be. And so if you want to buy an R5 new, you're gonna have to spend a lot of money to get one. I'd also recommend avoiding any used cameras. I think used is a little risky, especially in the R5 case when these cameras are being tested by who knows how many people, they're putting them in freezers, they're putting them in fridges, they're taking the cases apart to see what's overheating, what's not. You don't know what the person before you did to the camera and specifically with the R5, because there's been so much experimentation and tinkering, I'd be really hesitant to buy an R5 used because that person could have done some serious damage to it that you don't know about. I do think the Canon R5 is an incredible camera, and that's honestly why it is so disappointing in so many ways. There is so much power and potential in this camera that feels limited or restricted unnecessarily. If Canon had done a better job delivering all the specs that are here to their fullest, I think we would have a camera that's universally loved. Instead, we got something that's very controversial and divisive, where you have photographers who exclaim the benefits of the Canon R5, and I'm, I'm one of them. The photography capabilities of this camera are incredible, and it's fantastic to use for taking photos. But on the video side, it feels more of the photo version of video, and I don't think that's where we're at nowadays, where people want a true hybrid that feels like a proper video tool, not just a photography camera with video capabilities. Overall, I would say the R5 is an eight out of 10. Maybe I've been going kind of hard on it in the second half, but I really wanted to point out my minor nitpicks and gripes. Overall, I do think it's a really impressive camera, definitely for photography, but also for video as well. It's got excellent quality, both photo and video looks great. It's fantastic. And you get 4K 120, you get 8K if you want. It's really impressive. But there's some really annoying restrictions, not just the thermal locking, but also just in the functionality and using the camera, not being able to use it to its fullest all the time is very frustrating. And these unnecessary limitations, I'm, I'm kind of just done with it. I think Canon has always kind of done this to their DSLR or hybrid cameras, and it feels so unnecessary, especially with these kind of timer resets that people are implementing now with the overheating issues that are happening. You can just reset it with the date change and a battery pull. So really, it's not, it is just a timer. It has nothing to do with temperature and some of the restrictions when you're recording video, just what's being displayed. Why can't the camera show me all the settings on the fly? Why can't I change my white balance on the fly? It's maybe a little bit of a nitpick, a little bit of a gripe, but I do think it's important to point out because there's many other cameras that feel far more intuitive when you're shooting video. Overall, I would say the R5 feels like a photography camera that has a video mode, but it doesn't feel like a true hybrid camera. The R5 could have been the perfect, well-rounded camera that applied to everyone relatively equally, except it just feels a little limited in ways that I really wish Canon had spent a little bit more time thinking these things through, giving those features, putting them there for the people who do need them and rely on them, because if that had been done, and they could have mitigated the overheating issues more, or at least not even had them to begin with, I think we'd really have what could be the perfect camera for everybody. I'm kind of back where I started in a lot of ways with the R5. I came in really disappointed that it even had the overheating thermal lockdown 
issues on the R5 and on the R6. And hearing that from the reviews was just really disappointing because I wanted to love the R5, but I ended up not feeling so great about it. So I went into this very skeptical. And upon initial shooting with the R5, I felt pretty good, especially taking photos. It felt very comfortable, felt very intuitive. I come from Canon shooting, so it feels right to take photos with these cameras. And I started to really enjoy the autofocus and the menus and just using the camera felt really good. And I started to be kind of delighted by it. But then I encountered the thermal locking, which is frustrating. And it made me change the way I shoot in terms of thinking more about the limits placed upon me by the camera rather than just, hey, this would be a cool creative shot. I'm gonna get it at 4K 120 or I'm gonna switch to 8K for this particular shot because I need the resolution or, oh, I'm gonna go do 4K HQ for this because I want it to really look its best. Instead, I'm calculating in the back of my mind, oh, well, I can't use those modes or I don't wanna overheat the camera. I gotta make sure I'm turning it off. I gotta make sure I'm not using it too much. And, and now you're just doing this balancing act of trying to keep the camera happy so that you can actually use it the way you want. And you feel subservient to the camera rather than the camera serving you as a tool in your toolkit. And so my enthusiasm dove a little bit, but then I would review the footage and really be happy with the resolution that's there and the color and the autofocus. The IBIS leaves something to be desired. It's not the best, but it's, it's fine, whatever. It's there, I guess. So overall, it's kind of mixed. It is a great camera. I would say it's an eight out of 10, but I also wouldn't say it's something you have to have or you should go buy right now, especially considering the prices. Who knows if they'll actually unlock the overheating issues. I, I doubt it at this point. They've just done kind of better temperature management, but even then it's still annoying and clearly just a timer at some level in the camera. I'm, I'm curious if there's going to be damage to these cameras long term for the people who are using and abusing them and, and recording 8K constantly, pushing it to its limit. Is it too hot? I don't know. And I think that's also really frustrating that we even have to think about these things or consider them when the camera should just kind of work the way it ought to work. It's a very expensive camera and to put that much money into a tool, you really expect it to, to work to its fullest potential. And right now the R5 seems limited in that regard. I haven't shot with the R6 yet. Maybe I'll get my hands on it at some point, but the way Canon treats the video mode in general just doesn't feel like the right camera for me at this point in time. I'd, I'd prefer something that felt more intuitive, that just gave me the information I needed rather than having to constantly be stopped, be interrupted, dive through menus to access what I want regularly. These are normal features that are part of shooting video that I rely on constantly. And for them not to be there at my fingertips and, and be kind of hidden or kind of buried or unable to access is also just a, a minor irritation that just builds up over time where it is just really frustrating. Shooting photos works great. Everything's right there, everything you would want. For video, not so much. And that's why I really think that Canon has designed a photography camera with a video mode but they haven't spent the time to make a true hybrid, which if they had, they could have had one of the best cameras of all time. Instead, they ended up missing the mark and maybe missing it more than they, they initially expected. I think the R5 will rub a lot of people the wrong way. And I'm sure there's people who will hate it far more than me. They'll give it like a one out of 10. And then I'm sure there's other people who will give it 10 out of 10. For me, it's right at that, you know, B, B level. It's not an A, A plus camera. It's maybe like a B minus. It's right in that range of just low 80s. It feels really good for what it does, but you wish that it did more of that better in other modes and just felt as good as a video camera as it does as a photo cam because it's very close. It's not far off the mark. I'm not asking for XLR inputs or SDI, you know, or anything crazy like that. It's just giving people access to what's already there, what's already built in the camera. Just open it up, unlock the, the thermal management nonsense, cut that out, and give people the opportunity to use this camera to its fullest, and I think you'll have very happy customers. But right now, that's clearly not the case.